Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today on our uh, uh, Canadian Licensed Cannabis Producer Virtual Conference with BDO. Uh, my name is Brendan Kidd. I'm uh, BDO's National Cannabis Group Leader. And I have a great uh, uh, group of speakers here today to speak about uh, current events uh, affecting licensed producers in the cannabis industry. Um, the speakers we have with us today include Dan Four. Uh, Dan is a Chief Operating Officer of Heritage Cannabis. We have Gil Yim, who is the Director of Internal Audit at Tilray. Uh, Melissa Polak is the Senior Director, Enterprise and Risk Assurance with Aurora. We have Thomas Adams, and he is the VP of Finance with Afria. And last but not least, we have Nathan Meissen, who is the co-chair of the National Cannabis Working Group, uh, with the, uh, which is a subset of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. So we're going to start our, our session off today with a fireside chat between myself and, and Nathan. Hi, Nathan. How are you this Hi, morning? How are you? Good, good. Thanks very much for, for joining us in this fine morning. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. So the, the thing we, we're going to chat about um, this morning is, uh, is, is the issue around ancillary services to the cannabis mm -hmm. industry in Canada. It's, you know, I, I quite often have people reaching out to, uh, to me looking for uh, recommendations on banks uh, specifically that, uh, that will work with uh, licensed producers and other businesses in the cannabis industry. I'm, I'm curious, um, what, what kind of services do you quite often see in short supply um, to participants in the cannabis uh, sector? Well, I think it's an interesting question. You know, the you know we're coming up to the third year of legalization, October seventeenth of twenty twenty one, and it's interesting in the fact that the cannabis sector still has a lot of the tropes and stereotypes of the past. Um, primarily, it's businesses um, that provide crucial business services uh, that are fundamental to any businesses that have cross border exposure. So banking and insurance are two of the primary ones that uh, the sector has had significant problems with. You know, you've heard stories as as uh, extreme as people having their personal bank accounts and mortgages released um, because the bank doesn't want to deal with them anymore because they're in, in the cannabis sector. I think that was definitely early days. I think we're seeing some more um, movement in that space, but you know, the, the big, um, multilateral banks are still struggling, um, in that space. I think as we see movement in the safe banking act in the States, um, uh, and as we push down towards that, even outside of, um, uh, legalization, I think we'll see much more of that start to come, but it is a new sector. Um, and it's been very difficult for, you know, insurance as you, you know, when, when you, you use long-term analysis to project the risk so that you can assess people's costs. This isn't a sector where with that information has been readily available. So, you know, um, I think those are two specific areas where, um, there's real opportunity. Uh, as well to find innovative solutions in Canada that as the world continues to uh, legalize cannabis, um, those businesses can take that experience and move it abroad as well. Hmm. Now, in terms of causes for, for the reluctance to be involved in the industry, I mean, you kind of alluded to uh, uh, the U.S. legal environment, and I, I understand a lot of banks because they are ultimately federally regulated in the U.S., mm -hmm. there's, there's an issue for them there. Um, you know, what, what what do you think perhaps in general are, are, are uh, kind of the primary causes why companies are are uh, reluctant to to get involved? Lack of understanding, they, you know, the risks, uh, people perceived risks. Um, you know, I, I think it's a real um, when you look at the scrutiny that bank or that the cannabis businesses have to go at the three orders of government between a municipal, provincial, and federal level, um, it, it's unbelievable, right? Like I've had my uh, personal information vetted so many times that I feel like I could be a CSIS operator or a CIA operator because I have I should have that level of classified uh, clearance because of how much information they've done. So I think it's interesting in the fact that um, the primarily again the banks and the insurance industry have, have, have struggled and I think there has been significant movements as the conversation that we're having today. Um, but you know, they haven't understood. And I think that um, has created misunderstanding. I think, you know, again, when 
you were coming into our third year uh, um, of legalization of an adult use recreation space. And, you know, the people that uh, my colleagues that will be on the network uh, are on the panel later um, have been operating in the space longer than that. But, you know, when we talk about full cannabis legalization in Canada, we are looking at three years. That's not a lot of times for a new sector that was overcoming stereotypes and tropes where there was literally movies made about how this was going to create promiscuity in women and cause suicide in men, right? Like that's not normally when an IT sector comes up or the tech bubble comes up, people aren't going to be like the internet's going to cause you to run off a building out an open window, right? So I think there's lots of historical harms um, that we had to overcome, but we're seeing big movement in that regard. And, and it's, it's exciting also because it's a big money sector. You know, like that, that, that's, I think, one of the things that's really interesting. Um, StatsCan released uh, some information last week that uh, December of 2021, or sorry, December of 2020, uh, the economic contribution to cannabis to the Canadian economy was $17.9 billion, which is $2.1 billion behind the entire automotive industry in Canada. You know, could you imagine if cannabis got treated a tenth of as well as the automotive industry? You know, it, 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 and when you talk about ancillary businesses, cultivation and retail was estimated um, in January of 2021 as $3.3 billion of economic contribution. So when you take that $17.9 billion and that $3.3 billion, ancillary businesses make $14.6 billion of economic contribution to the Canadian economy. And that's where I'm happy about this conversation is those are traditional businesses that are becoming cannabis businesses right. where that expertise is created at home but as 66 nations around the world are talking about cannabis legalization there's an opportunity for us to build successful domestic businesses and export them around the world as cannabis legalization continues to roll absolutely yeah i mean we're, we're certainly seeing that i mean with with uh with our firm um, having mm -hmm. been on the forefront of the cannabis industry rolling out here and being a multinational firm, mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly seeing many places around the world where they're reaching out to us because we have so much expertise having been in the industry for, for even five or six years. It's, it's uh, uh, valuable in the, in the world stage. And how often is it that Canadian businesses are the bell of the ball? Right. Like we don't get to be that very often. Right. We're not leading sectors. This is a sector that we are leading. And I think we need to pivot the conversation because we hear so often that Canada has lost its first mover advantage. And I definitely agree that in certain circumstances we have uh, the cultivation is a very tough environment because it's the foundational block that all cannabis legalization goes through. Um, but, you know, we have four of the world's largest cannabis retailers housed in here. We have new businesses that have never exist that provide financial services, building, consulting services, packaging. Those are all here that are now starting to look abroad. And that's a really exciting opportunity for us to continue to scale uh, Canadian cannabis opportunity um, domestically and abroad. And I, I think those are the conversations that uh, will pick up. And hopefully we can make sure we put into the ethos of policymakers, politicians and Canadians to realize that there is something significant that's creating good jobs as well. Absolutely. So with, with education kind of being at the core of, of uh, improving you know, this, this, this dynamic, uh, how, how do you, uh, what, what mechanisms, I guess, do we have, have at our fingertips to, to help make that happen? I know that there's the work of the, the National Cannabis Working Group that you're a part of. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about uh, the efforts going on there and what other other areas you see could could be helpful in this regard. Well, I think the first thing first um, is the ancillary businesses. So when you talk about fourteen point six billion dollar uh, economic impact, uh, impact, you know those are not cannabis businesses. Those are businesses and actually some of those businesses might be purpose-built where those are solely cannabis businesses but are a lot of them are traditional economic actors that were existing prior to cannabis where they have moved into cannabis as an, a revenue line um, that has continued to grow a great example is scott growers right that that indicated 142 percent increase in sales because they become one of the predominant um, uh, suppliers of um, um, products for the cannabis sector, the, we need to mobilize those people and make them 
talk about the fact that they are cannabis uh, business revenue generating companies now. And, and one of the things about the chamber that I think is very exciting is by working with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, we also have all of the provincial Chamber of Commerce that are involved as well. And that allows us to push the conversation where the provinces um, can ask their members and the municipalities can ask their members, are, are you doing businesses in the cannabis sector? So by us doing something as simple as putting our hand up and saying, I am doing cannabis business, allows us to continue to push the conversation of who's a cannabis business. So it's not just retailers and cultivators. When we're going in and advocating for change that builds the sector, um, it's not it's not just us on our own. It's a much wider breadth um, who are advocating. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that we have to do. Um, you know, when we see polling that has come out from a number of polling organizations, primarily Canadians have moved on when it comes to cannabis legalization, right? right? Like, they, like the last federal election, 0.4% of Canadians said that they were going to vote based on cannabis legalization. That was behind animal welfare, right? Like, so if the Canadian citizenry has moved off of cannabis legalization, what works can we do to make sure that policymakers, influencers, and um, bureaucrats realize that they are not representing the Canadian ethos anymore about cannabis? And that cultivators and retailers but traditional businesses uh, coming in and being like hey don't screw up this new golden goose that's almost as big as the automotive industry in less than three years of full legalization so you know the chamber is a is a key facet of that just because of its ability to really coalesce uh, and coordinate those businesses and add that into the conversation um, where we're talking about the sector not just specific channels within the sector, but taking that sector-based approach so we can represent that $17.9 billion. Um, you know, because if you think about it, the, the there was numbers that came out on Friday that showed that cannabis sales in Canada could be $9 billion um, by 2025. Um, again, in a three and a half times multiplier, um, you're looking at a $50 billion business in our sector in Canada that's fairly significant. So how can we gestate that and get it going as quick as possible so that we can create good jobs and good opportunity through a COVID recovery? And the Chamber's effort is to help normalize those conversations for us to unlock those economic possibilities while still being responsible and dedicated to displacing the illicit market, keeping cannabis out of the hands of youth and creating regulated overseen products. So I, I think we, we're doing a great job on most of that, but we can do more on telling people the story of success. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your insight to this issue and uh, I look forward to, to collaborating with you on the working group. It's an exciting group to be part of. Congratulations and thank you very much for the opportunity to listen to this great uh, panel. It's lots of exciting stuff with all the changes in the states happening. It's more and more relevant. So thank you very much and have a great day. You too. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Okay, so now we'll um, move on to the uh, panel portion of the discussion. We'll bring the uh, panelists on here. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much for uh, for joining us this morning to talk about uh, licensed producers. Um, maybe uh, would you like to each just take a, a quick uh, thirty seconds to introduce yourself? I gave your your names and your companies earlier. Is there anything you want to quickly say about your your background before we start? We can start with uh, with Dan. So that's your sure. Uh, Dan Four, I'm the COO and CFO of Heritage Cannabis Holdings. Uh, we are a licensed producer with uh, two licensed facilities on either side of the country, producing products both for the rec market and the and the medical market. My background, primarily finance. Uh, I was a banker uh, on Bay Street for a better part of a decade before moving into the cannabis space about two and a half years ago. Um, and I've been enjoying the ride ever since. Great, great. Um, Gil, uh, you're next uh, alphabetically. Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. Gil Yim here. I'm Director of Internal Audit at Tilray. I've been with the company for a little over two years now. 
uh, prior to joining the cannabis space. I was primarily in tech. Uh, before that, I was at Shopify and spent about 10 years out in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Great. Uh, Melissa. Great. Thanks so much, Brendan. So I'm Melissa Polak. I'm the Senior Director of Enterprise Risk and Insurance. So I run an enterprise risk management internal audit for Aurora Cannabis. So we're one of the, the globe's biggest producers and we own the brands of Aurora, MedRelief and uh, Whistler. So very uh, large product portfolio. Thanks. Great. And Thomas. Good, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Thomas Adams. I'm the VP of Finance at Afria. I've been with Afria for over three years now, which feels like an eternity in the cannabis space. <laughs> um, prior to my time at Afria, I was actually auditing cannabis companies. Uh, and, and then I switched over to join the other side and, and work within them. Uh, my time at Afria has seen a huge amount of change and it's been really incredible to see the industry take shape as, it, as it's gone for the past three years. So it's been quite, quite an experience. Absolutely. Great. Before we get to the questions, this, uh, uh, for the audience, um, what we'll be doing uh, following the panel discussion is a, is a bit of a QA. and a um, If you'd like to type your questions in, uh, if you click on stage, which is to your top right, and you'll see within uh, the stage section there's chat, polls, and Q&A. Um, if you uh, ask your questions within the, the Q&A, um, then we'll use those for that session later on. And you can also like other people's questions. So if you see someone post a question that uh, you're interested in, please do click like. It'll help us to kind of identify the, um, the questions with the most interest in the audience. So an interesting time for the cannabis industry, very exciting. Um, I mean, particularly with the, the change in the administration um, in the United States uh, late last year, uh, that uh, certainly drove uh, a lot of excitement and investor interest in the cannabis industry, which was great because it was uh, kind of a tough uh, year uh, preceding that, and it's nice to be back on top again. Um, I'm curious, uh, what what are your expectations in terms of um, legalization of uh, cannabis at the federal level in the United States? Um, maybe around likelihood and, and timing. Um, anyone want to throw a an estimate out there of what they think is going to happen over the next couple of years. Uh, I'm I'm happy to jump in on there. Um, I know, like we've been watching the U.S. cannabis space for some time as it's kind of been developing. Uh, I find it extremely interesting where it's going to. I think with how many states have now already legalized it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, federal legalization is not any more a question as if, but more a question as to when. Personally. Um, and I think the, the other question that is always very intriguing about the when is how is legalization going to take form? The current structure that we're in right now with these statewide, um, in inter or in state full programs is not like any other industry. And I don't think that it's going to stand the test of time. I think the federal government, once it starts picking up that legalization trend, we're going to see a lot of changes over the coming years. And I think that legalization path is going to be um, a lengthy one that's going to take some time. And there's going to be massive, you know, events that will happen. And I think the first event will be decriminalization of cannabis. And I think that's going to happen within one to two years at the absolute most. Interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd kind of piggyback off what Thomas was saying, and I think the kind of the operative word is years. Um, I, I think from a federal standpoint, absolutely, it's not a matter of if, but when. So I, I do think that that would be, you know, it's probably a, a couple of years away from a federal standpoint, but on a state by state basis, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised by early next year that we've seen most of the states fall which means that we're operating amongst 52 different countries in one country um, and trying to navigate that. So I think ultimately it'll be anything but seamless, which has been kind of proven north of the border, but uh, it's coming and it'll, it'll come fast. I just not, a, I, I don't see it on a federal level being super fast. So I do agree with the decriminalization within a year or two. I think the decriminalization is going to have some really interesting aspects to it though, because uh, Brendan, you, you mentioned and you talked about the 
banking issues that a lot of companies are facing. Decriminalizing that is one of the steps to remove that barrier, but it has other unintended or possibly intended consequences. I'm not, I can't really speak for the government's mindset there, um, but I'm very interested to see in terms of when that happens, you're now look, looking at um, tax law, which I think a lot of people don't really talk about much, but the current tax regime requires cannabis companies operating in the US to not claim any deductions on any of their expenses because they're dealing with a federally illegal substance. And once you decriminalize that, that goes away. I don't see the, the government that quickly walking away from all that money. I think they're going to start seeing tax reform immediately following that at the same time. Right. And so once that happens, then the next question goes to interstate light, right? You have this in the 50 countries, right? Within one. Um, well, once you have it decriminalized federally, there's no law that prevents you from, from working within the different states. Uh, it's kind of the, the state imposed thing that I think, you know, lobbyists and, and lawyers are going to have a field day challenging and, and pushing for changes that are going to take some time as that gets challenged and developed. But though some of those barriers will, uh, I don't want to say go away fully, but will definitely change, right? And you're going to have to start having some competitors that will have to compete nationally rather than just having one state to compete in. Yeah. Yeah, I so would, um, go ahead, Melissa. Thanks, Gil. I, I would definitely echo just what Dan and Thomas have been saying. I think when we look at the US, we like to think of it as cautious optimism. Um, the fact of the matter is, like jurisdictionally, they always have more decentralized power at the state level. And so I think when you look at who's actually winning right now in the US, it's a lot of those MSOs that do have larger footprints. But when I think about what will um, benefit the Canadian LPs that are looking to make a play in the US. It's also being able to scale up relatively quickly, working with regulators around different types of restrictions around products, distribution, manufacturing. Um, you know, all of those things are, are key skill sets that will be harder to ramp up from the US than if you were coming in as a Canadian LP. However, you know, when we when we think about it or when I think about it, obviously, because I, I don't necessarily speak on behalf of the entire Aurora organization, but I, you know, it's it's you feel handcuffed right now because of the fact that if you're a public LP, you cannot venture into the cannabis space in any meaningful way in the US. You're kind of stuck with auxiliary products or things that are only strictly related to CBD, like really bad. So um, anyway, sorry, Gil, I, I interrupted you there. No, I, I was going to say, um, I agree with everyone here that I think um, federal legalization is just a matter of time. But what can't be understated and what I think is equally as important is um, how regulatory bodies like the DEA or, or the FDA establishes their position. Um, we've seen it with CBD and hemp, right? FDA has been kind of wishy-washy on, on their position on it, causing companies to feel like they're navigating a gray market. And um, that's definitely slowed down the, the um, go-to-market strategies of CBD in the US. Absolutely. For sure. I mean, just on that point too, like what's really interesting is, is who will actually regulate cannabis in a lot of ways, right? Like when we look at the US or Canada, sorry, and the fact that Health Canada regulates all cannabis products, whether or not it's a food or a like consumable product, um, whereas normally you would have say CFI or other regulatory bodies, right? So there's just so much that needs to kind of play out logistically with all the different regulators in the US and given their patchwork model, it will be an interesting challenge. <laughs> But I think you also have to look at historically, you know, this state MSO model protectionism over kind of in-state jobs and, and production and all this stuff that's preventing competition from out of state kind of really competing in those markets. I don't think that's sustainable, right? I think legally there's not really a lot of legs to, there's, it's not a lot of strength to stand on there legally once the federal government decriminalizes it. And then you also have to look at all these other larger businesses that have heavy resources around lobbying and all this other stuff that are going to want to get involved beyond the Canadian LPs who are going to also want to be, you know, taking taking a bite out of that as well. And so I look at that and that vertical integration that's currently set up in the MSO models is going to be very hard to sustain long term. Now, the question is, what's that term, right? I'd say long term, but 
is that going to be two years? Is that going to be three years? Is that going to be four years? Um, we don't quite know that answer yet. And I think it's going to be exciting to see that. And I think, you know, the importance of these MSOs is they're getting a huge, they're getting a huge amount of progress towards getting profitability, building in good businesses that are parts of it will be able to stay. Um, but I'm very interested to see how that develops when this starts to change and how this change is going to unfold. And I think the importance is being profitable and being <laughs> agile, working in these um, changing environments, right? And so you need to be adaptable to regulatory change. Absolutely. I mean, it, it'll clearly, you know, there's going to be opportunity with federal legalization, but clearly much complexity. I mean, what, what kind of company is going to be best positioned to benefit from this? When I say what kind of company, like what, what, uh, what kind of resources and qualities of a company is going to have it best set up for success when it does open up federally in the States, how are they going to be able to insert themselves and compete in the U.S. market? What, what qualities are necessary? Well, it's, um, if I was to hop in there, I think it's, again, it feels like I'm always coming after Thomas, but um, <laughs> one of the things that he, he just mentioned is, you know, is, it, is the MSO model sustainable? And so when you're asking the question on qualities, I think there's really two phases. There is the, the money, the capital, the land grab phase, which is effectively the phase that we're in right now. And then we start transitioning into the innovation phase, right? As, as a market starts opening up, it's no longer going to be the guys with the biggest wallets. It's going to be the guys and companies that are producing the best products. How long it takes us to get there is ultimately the question. So when we're taking a look at how the market is developing right now, it's got to go through phases. And the, the first phase that we're in right now is let's throw money at it, grab as much land as we can, and then weather the storm and the write-offs and everything else will start to happen. And at the same time, kind of the innovation comes in. So it's hard to pick what is the correct characteristics right now because you need the capital to grab the land, but you need to be nimble enough and be able to pivot to create valuable products for the consumers and the patients, which is kind of that next wave. It feels like similar to how Canada's operated, it's almost two different stages. And uh, we're moving into the first stage south of the border, and we're moving into the second stage here north of the border. I, I Dan, I think you put it very well. I think you're, I, I don't mean to, to say like the MSO models are not successful. I think they can be very successful. I think they're, they're, they can be a very good business. Um, but I just don't think it's a long-term business, right? But getting that advantage to start, like, as Dan said, build some of the foundational pieces for the future. There's a lot of value there, right? And you can build brands, you can build things that resonate with consumers. You can build distribution channels. You can build retail outlets, all of these different components you can build. I just personally believe that longer term, you will have to shift and pick one of the, um, categories to play in. And you might have the opportunity to play, pick two. You might have the opportunity to, in certain states, pick three in some way, shape, or form. But I think like, to be able to do the true MSO format and to really take over the nation, it's not going to be that simple. Um, and I don't think it's, it's going to start opening up and you're going to see more competition coming in. Yeah, absolutely. I think the two things we touched upon is um, infrastructure and branding. And I can't help to think that companies that already have those two things established, such as big alcohol companies, CPGs, tobacco, are gonna enter the game once it becomes federally legal, right? So um, yeah, to your point, I, I only see competition increasing. I almost wonder though, just watching the Canadian market evolve and how we used to emphasize for LPs, how it was funded capacity at first, right? Like that was the big mover and shaker. And then it was production. How much, how many kilos are we actually producing? And then it was like, oh, wait a minute, how much is actually the selling through? And so we finally shifted the conversation to profitability. So I definitely think that the capital investment is a huge component of it. There'll have to be, you know, that type of investment in the US, but do we actually leapfrog that a little bit so they don't go through the same growing pains that Canada went through when we were trying to figure it out? And they look towards things that would require less of an actual physical footprint and more ability to just expand at a, a very rapid pace. So I know for us, for instance, we like to prioritize our science portfolio when it comes to genetics, because we think about, 
okay, like what's the best way for us to actually have the biggest reach? And in a lot of ways, it's not necessarily building out facilities in each of the states, which likely will have nuanced regulations, but actually licensing out products, right? So there's a bunch of different ways I think you can go at it and just having the maturity and experience of even half of a decade in Canada, I think that will shift a lot of the conversation in the US where they can kind of take a lot of our lessons learned and not necessarily go through the same challenges that we went through and just getting this industry set up. So. And, and every, I think almost every LP now, you know, Aurora, you, you're there, Melissa, for at Aurora, seeing how you guys have kind of gone through and your approach to the U.S. Um, we have made our, like, Afria and Celery both made our independent entrances through a U.S. channels in one, uh, one way. Um, and we're continuing to evaluate different ways of consistently penetrating, consistently eating up that market share and really getting involved there. Um, but while, while playing carefully within the, regula the regulations that's currently allowed and where we believe the future is going to go, right? And so that expectation, I think, changes very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. new things get proposed, new bills get kind of talked about. And, you know, another thing that, you know, doesn't get talked about is the, the social reform, right? I think that's going to be a driving agenda to legalization. And I think... Um, going back to my, my concept on the taxes, you know, when that tax changes and you're going to have this new format of taxation that's going to have to be created to preserve the income for the government, uh, whether they do an excise model similar to alcohol and, and cannabis in, the, in Canada or something else, you have to build for that. You have to be prepared for that and your business has to be adaptable to that. And those, that, ca that tax savings is, or if there's tax savings or additional taxes, it's going to flow to the ultimate price to the consumer. The consumers are going to be the ones who are going to also drive a lot of this. And I think that awareness needs to be built in the consumer because they're also the voters. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the U.S. is, is kind of the, the, the big story recently, but I, I think what's uh, been overshadowed a little bit is, is the, the growing expansion globally of cannabis legalization. I mean, it seems almost every every week or two you're seeing in the media uh, countries that are um, introducing legalization are announcing that they're working towards it. I mean, Mexico's a big, big market. The EU continues to open up. I mean, a lot of opportunity, a lot of big populations um, uh, for, uh, for companies to enter into. Um, so how, how, how are Canadian LPs looking to, to capitalize and, and compete on the, on the world stage? Yeah, I mean, I go ahead, Gil. No, I, I think um, I speak for Tillery when when I say um, we've definitely been uh, focused on the international international markets. Uh, we built out a facility out in Portugal to act as our, our EU hub. And keep me honest here, guys, but I think there's about 40 countries that have legalized cannabis. And to your point, Brendan, I think every 12 to 18 months, we're seeing a handful of more companies uh, legalized. So we continue to see the uh, the regulatory and legislative landscape changing. And I don't think that's a fad. I think it's a trend that's going to continue. Um, and it, it's an area that we're very much focused on because um, the cost of cannabis is in certain cases much higher in international markets. So there's definitely uh, a profitability play there as well. Yeah, yeah. it's a Go on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just going to like piggyback off Gil and say, I agree. I think a lot of the big players do already have a presence internationally. I think, you know, it's kind of less sexy than the US in a lot of ways, just because it is focused more on medical, generally really restricted, generally very centrally regulated and distributed. So um, I think it's sort of been like a bit of a low murmur that, you know, at the same time, even though we do see new countries come on, they're definitely doing so cautiously. Um, but I, I do think they're also looking to Canada to see how those markets develop in terms of waiting past medical and looking more at recreational legalization. Yeah, it's, you know, from my perspective over at, at Harriet, in terms of how we take a look at the market, there, there, when Nathan mentioned there's 66 countries that are in discussion on, on legalizing, right? It feels like every, every week there's another country. It's very, unless you've got very, very deep pockets and you just want to splash, uh, if you are not focused, I think you can get burned really bad. Um, markets are all different sizes. There's a lot of different things to navigate. Um, yes, the U.S. is, is super sexy, 
Um, that being said, I think you strategically have to select which countries and how you want to penetrate them and what your strategy is. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's one of these things where you can just boil the ocean and then you're left with nothing. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I think it's definitely a, a great opportunity for Canadian LPs because we do have somewhat of a first mover advantage. But I think at the same time, if we're not careful, um, we can deploy a lot of capital and not get a lot of return. Dan, I'm, I'm going to echo on you for once now and follow up <laughs> you. Um, I, I think that the, the international market and the U.S. market, they're all flowing kind of similar, even the Canadian market. It all starts medical first, and then we start to see the kind of that transition into these um, different things. Now, the big difference is between federal and, and states within the U.S., but other than that, you're really seeing that momentum pick up and that, that transition happen towards legalization fairly consistently. Um, it's all a matter of timing. And as Dan said, you know, there's a lot of different international markets and there's a lot of them to be very excited about, but timing, because, you know, you don't want to sink in all of this resources and stuff for a market that is so heavily regulated and so hard to penetrate that you can only get, you know, scraps for the next five years that you're dumping money into trying to invest to grow. Um, that agility and that profitability is, hugely important. And I know uh, both Tilray and Afria, which is soon to be all just Tilray, um, hopefully, or we'll see how the merger votes go. Um, that one of the industry or one of the countries that's very exciting to us is Germany. And one of the big reasons why Germany is exciting to us is largely because uh, their insurance covers cannabis, right? And when your insurance covers cannabis as a user, who has uh, any medical use for it that you need it for, when you're paying out of pocket, you're a lot less inclined to continue to refill those prescriptions. Mm -hmm. When your insurance covers it, you really start to actually utilize it to the most that you can and, and you see the consumption levels increase. And that's hugely important and really is attractive as a market to, to look at as you're kind of investigating these markets. Now, that's one market as an example, but there's, large world that we live in and there's a lot of different markets to continue to evaluate investigate and find ways to get in there but the importance is is focusing on on being agile and being flexible to grow with the absolutely so with with uh with these uh new markets opening up and all this change in, in the cannabis industry um, you know, I, I think we have been seeing uh, some increased M&A activity over the last uh, six months or so. Um, as as uh, Thomas mentioned, uh, there's, there's the uh, discussions going on between Afri and, and Tilray as a, as a kind of a larger example. Um, what 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 are your expectations around um, the trends? I guess as as the U.S. opens up and the international markets open up, are we going to see more more M&A? Are, are the innovative smaller companies going to get bought up by the bigger ones or or uh, how, what, what do you think we're going to see um, um, in the next uh, year or two in this regard? I can imagine that we will see, a, I mean, I'm sure none of the companies here have seen any M&A activity. If you look at <laughs> we're in the table right now. But I'm, I'm sure you'll see some of that scramble again once the U.S. really starts to open up where, you know, some of it is a little bit about, you know, just trying to predict the future and understand what will be the best play in, in the U.S. And so you kind of do a bit of a scramble and grab as many things as you can. Um, and then, you know, things inevitably play out where some things are a win and some things are a big, big loss. So um, I can certainly imagine that the M&A activity will continue to increase. Um, I, I'm very curious to see who will be the sort of initiator of said M&A activity. I think it will evolve over time where for the, you know, for the foreseeable short term future, it'll ought to be like cannabis cluster industry sticking together um, or larger LPs acquiring smaller either craft producers or more innovative um, organizations that add something to their portfolio but then i could see that flipping eventually maybe in you know a few years down the line where it's actually larger cbd cbg companies that don't historically have a base in cannabis that are then going to start absorbing a lot of the cannabis larger players as well so i think it will evolve over time but i'm sure we'll start to see kind of a similar flurry in the us as we saw in canada at the, at the get-go so 
Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think I think we're still in the first inning in terms of uh, the consolidation of the market, right? I think uh, Melissa touched on a good point that most of the M and activity so far has been kind of incestuous. We're seeing a lot of within the cannabis space, but as you see um, other markets opening up, and especially especially U.S. Uh, once it becomes federally legal, you'll see other players like the ones um, Melissa mentioned, like the CPGs, alcohol, tobacco, come in come in uh, to get a piece of the pie as well. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting, right? Because I think if you look at any industry, it goes through that innovation startup phase. And I agree with Gil, we're in the first inning. I don't see any established players really coming in and in a meaningful way and sinking big bucks into the space to generate return. I think they want us to feel it out, generate something, actually build a business, and then they'll hop in and take it. Um, I think amongst the group on the panel here, I think Heritage has been, is definitely the smallest of the bunch and we've had to kind of navigate the waters a little bit differently. Um, but we've actually gone a different route than others in terms of how we're scaling our business and going down the innovation path that uh, Melissa, Melissa spoke about. So it'll be interesting. I think there will be a land grab at the same time. I don't think people know what they want from a company standpoint. I think the strategies are still being formulated and designed um, and depending on how big your pockets are, you're gonna you're gonna devise a strategy that suits kind of the current platform that you have the best. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it uh, how it all plays out. I do think that there'll be a lot more M and A activity, and if they mirror what happens in Canada, um, it won't be a direct scale up to start with. I think they'll you're gonna go down the the, the path of kind of products and innovation, uh, and then backfill. But we'll it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I think, you know, there, there already has been, if you look back since the inception of really the legalization in Canada and the market and has its, how it's developed, we've already seen some of the big players take, dip their toes in, if you will, with Altria's investment in Kronos, Canopy, uh, or Constellation's investment in Canopy, and, you know, Afria has taken part in several, you know, mergers and acquisitions throughout the three years that we've been there. And the most recent being our, our investment in Sweetwater, the alcohol company, and where we're buying an alcohol company in the U.S. And the uh, the proposed merger between, you know, I'll say Gil and myself, but Afria and Tilray, <laughs> um, where Gil and I have been working already, you know, and know each other outside of this from our experience working on on the potential integration, which, you know, I invite anybody who to go look at AfriaTilrayTogether.com if they want more information. I don't want to go in, into any details beyond that um, as it's still kind of a work in progress. But I think the m and is it's, it's active within the industry and it will continue to be that way as we continue to move forward. And Dan, you touched upon a great point there when you say um, it will, it'll really depend on how deep companies' pockets are. Um, can't forget that once it becomes federally legal in the US, you'll see a lot of capital that's been sitting on the sidelines come into uh, U.S. companies as well, right? So uh, that's another factor that's going to be in play in the next couple of years. I don't think that goes just to U.S. companies. I think that's actually going to be distributed uh, more internationally. But a lot of them, they can't even invest because of their, yeah. their current restrictions, right? And so I right. think you're going to see some of these players who uh, have more opportunities. One thing that's really interesting that I think everyone actually just touched on is the fact that how do you structure the best M&A when you don't really have the ability to come up with a five-year strategy, right? Like there's always kind of the three and two and one-year strategies, but things evolve so quickly in cannabis. And I, I think Thomas made a good point. I've been at Aurora for two years and I kind of feel like it's been half of my life, um, but it, it just feels like elongated because of how much change there is, right? So um, I think it's hard to say what type of M&A activity will be the best in two years versus in five years because of that inability to set those long-term 10-year strategies, given how decent the industry is and the regulations around it, which, you know, strategically, you can have a lot of political support, but then when you get down to the logistics of it, it can really continue to hinder you. The, the uncertainties in the industry is probably one of my favorite things about working in it, right? And it's, you know, That's nothing's the same as the one thing that is so maybe let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit um, and talk about product. 
Um, I mean, uh, it, would, it would seem like the product development within Canada uh, has been stifled, I guess you could say, a bit by the regulatory regime and you know, the slowness of those regulations coming out and uncertainty. And, um, and, and honestly, I mean, what we currently have now isn't a particularly uh, attractive model for reaching out to consumers. Um, how, how would you see the, the product land landscape changing uh, going forward? Uh, I guess from my perspective, I hope it does change in terms of uh, kind of the, the blanket statement. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to be honest. Um, you know, it's very similar. When I was a banker, I was in the renewable space and it was very much a boom bust cycle because the government couldn't get out of its own way. So I, I, I think it's uh, one of these situations where I think the, it, the market will start to open up as everybody gets a little bit more comfortable, the stigma starts to be removed to allow us to actually produce different products for the consumers and the patients. Uh, how it happens uh, is a tough one. I think there's going to have to be reform. I think the consumers are going to have to lead this. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of closure between the legacy market. Well, we're seeing some closure, but not rapid closure between the legacy market and kind of the legal market. Uh, but we have to get innovative and new products into the consumers. Otherwise, uh, the industry will die without uh, the innovation. There's a lot of great people in the industry that can't produce what they need to produce because of the way the regulations are set up. Um, so anyway, that's my, my soapbox kind of thoughts on, on this topic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think regulatory reform is is a piece of it, and I think it's also just maturity within the industry. I think we're we're getting better at finding new products and getting the production and getting all that delivered to consumers. But it gets very difficult when when your hands are are somewhat tied when it comes to a marketing and advertising and getting it into the consumer's hands. You're very limited, um, and so I think again, it's it's a changing environment, and that those regulations will lift, and it's just persevering through these times and again making sure consumers making sure you have the push um from everyone who can lead the charge i think i i I'm, i like to think that you know we're we need to continue to lobby for that and continue to push as a industry for some of these changes that need to happen yeah i think about it from the risk angle of course um and when i when i look at just the way the regulations have evolved over time in terms of what they've allowed so initially just flour and oils um and even if you get into the nuance of the regulation around how they regulated those products between say concentrations or maximum thc content you can kind of tell that a lot of the times the regulators were kind of struggling themselves with wrapping their heads around how to regulate these products. And so I think they definitely are treading cautiously. What's nice is they have continued to, you know, push amendments to the regulations in Canada, but I would say definitely very slowly. So even with the 2.0 launch where you're allowed to, you know, produce more derivatives and edibles and, and things, it, it, one of our best sellers is a live resin that we can't keep on the shelves because there's so much demand for it, but it's so, barely allowed that you know in terms of our producing it it we've been really constricted in the ability to just really scale that up so um i think thomas also touched on a really good point a lot of it is how do you get those products into the hands of you know adult consumers and um between marketing restrictions packaging restrictions like some of these packaging things like i can't even open them myself and like <laughs> we did the quality assurance testing on it so it's it is funny to to see you know how I guess handcuffed again we are when it comes to the ability to market the products even compared to alcohols and tobaccos where you know we're not even allowed to run like ad campaigns in adult only magazines. Um, you really have to be creative around around reaching the consumer and and your patient base. And I know we're going to get into that later in terms of sort of how it is that we how it is that we reach those customers and sell to them. Um, but I do think that that's a big part of it is, you know, being able to have a, a broader reach, both when it comes to marketing, as well as just the product offerings that we're allowed to do, allowed to produce. So. Yeah, I think the regulators are, are working to try and fix that themselves though. Like as Melissa, as you said, like they're, they're also in the dark. So I think, you know, we got to give them credit for, for all the work they've put to try and make this as um, success. I don't think they're, they're doing it intentionally. And I think it's just something that, um, that really comes from communication, right? And understanding, hey, this is not working, this is, and continuing to work with regulators to make that better for the consumers. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great point. I mean, I think people are, are quick to uh, uh, criticize the government for 
the slow rollout of regulations, but it's it's a complex issue, and it's it's not as simple as as, as alcohol or, or something like that, uh, in terms of uh, who might accidentally get into it. And I mean, thinking of uh, minors and children specifically, right? It's uh, balancing uh, supporting the industry and its growth versus public safety, and uh, is a very difficult uh, nut to crack, I guess you could say. It, 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 it is, but I think it's also an interesting point because there's a lot of packaging out there for other forms, whether it be alcohol or whatever, that yeah, it looks like a juice box. It looks like everything else that people are consuming. So I think I hear all the points and then I just go back to, let's look at the data. Let's, let's see what it supports and let's make proper decisions based off of the data that we have supporting it versus you know, looking at it from a stigma standpoint. And I get this into this debate with my daughter all the time um, on the cannabis space versus the alcohol space and how negative it is. Um, but not you're not fully comparing apples to apples because there's so many other added benefits that get overlooked um, and don't get discussed. And I think we're kind of hiding behind a lot of different things here. Um, so I hear all of the points. I think we just got to go back to the data and understand what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and I agree, I think public safety should be at the utmost, um, but it should be across every industry, uh, not just the cannabis space. They need to build more consistency, I think. And yeah, I agree with that. There, There's a lot of inconsistencies and, you know, especially when you're looking at cannabis, because cannabis has, you know, two avenues really between adult use and medical. Yet they're treated very similarly in a lot of ways when logic dictates that they shouldn't be because you know you don't treat medicine the same as a non-medical product. Well, let's let's talk about um, uh, that that ultimate um, connection with the with the consumer. You know, the, the the retail model has been evolving and growing very rapidly over the last uh, last year year or so in particular. Um, and COVID, ironically, has been a, a great, great uh, accelerator for the for the retail sector in, in uh, Canada. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, people are, are connecting with that retail market in different ways. I mean, there's a whole group of consumers um, that are still getting comfortable with with uh, experimenting with cannabis and, and seeing how it, how it can benefit them. Um, and not all those people are interested in, in necessarily going to a physical shop. They might want to look at it online and kind of order it from the privacy of their own home. Um, I mean, how, how are you seeing the, the retail model evolving going forward and, and how is that going to ultimately affect the, the relationship between the, the producers of the products and, 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 uh, and the ultimate retailers? I, I think there's still a level of stigma attached to going to a re physical retail store. I mean, um, it's almost like for those of you that are old enough to remember uh, video stores, it's almost like seeing like the adult section in the back of the video store where everything is cordoned off. You can't see what's in there. Um, you kind of look over your shoulder to see if anyone's seeing you go in there. Um, so there's definitely needs to be some level of education with the consumers. And uh, we need to slowly break down that barrier of having that stigma attached to cannabis and, uh, and cannabis retail stores as well. <laughs> it's a good, a good point you make. You, know, you wonder why like, you have to frost the glass for cannabis stores, but you don't for alcohol distributors. Alcohol, right. I, um, I, when I think about what will be the most successful, I think it will be moving towards a platform that is really truly omni-channel, similar to a lot, of, a lot of the larger CPG companies, so that it's not like you have to go to one website for medical and then a government website for recreational, and then you go into brick and mortar stores, you don't really know what's there. I think the more that LPs and the regulators can work together to create some type of way of, I, I know for instance, when I look for a specific type of scotch, for instance, I can go to the manufacturer's website, they will give me a list of distributors. I can then go to a provincial store and figure out which stores locally actually carry that product. And so I think that will be a key component to actually being able to bring people's preferred products to them so that they're not going around and searching and, and it's essentially creating like a bit of a mystery box in terms of how it is that you can buy your product because of the availability. So um, I, I certainly think that kind of moving away from that kind of legacy platform of just like clicking and buying across five different ways, which I agree as well with Gil's point that there's a bigger stigma because not everyone wants to walk into a store, never wants to enter their personal information into five different platforms. 
Um, I think all of that will reduce barriers to consumers, both on the medical as well as on the adult use side. So. I think, you know, and there's a lack of availability in retail stores, specifically in Ontario, and they're working to, to fix that issue. Um, but again, you're, you're creating these retail stores, which are still going to be hindered by the fact that you don't have the ability to show your product and see what's on the shelf and get a clear understanding. But as of right now, you know, going back to our previous point, even if you could, you're just seeing warning labels after warning labor after warning labor. It's all hard to tell the difference sometimes between them. And so I think that's the, it's education of the consumers. Uh, it's improvements from regulations. It's education of the um, retailers as well to like help, you know, how do retailers manage within this very difficult environment to, to, to help, because they're the frontline staff with your consumer, right? And so, you know, your retailers are so incredibly important in terms of from an education piece to educate users, um, not only in terms of what the product that they have available, but on the environment. On the and what we're trying to do, why they're having to sign their name five times and things like that, and get some some public push behind. Some yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting because when you go into a dispensary, for the most part, ninety percent of the product is behind the counter. You can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't read about it. So so much of our sales getting our message out is left to the dispensaries and they can only absorb so much material um so with our hands tied we can't actually effectively properly market or discuss any of our products and now it's left into the hands of the dispensaries and they're doing the best that they can but they can't be out there promoting 500 companies products uh just not feasible so until we can actually change that part of the landscape and open up the LPs to allow us to discuss their products, we're kind of really uh, handcuffing the whole industry because we're putting it in the hands of dispensaries to get the message out and stuff on. Well, it comes back to the point uh, when I was talking to Nathan earlier on about education, yeah. you know, education the, pub the public and, and the, the standard setters and, and all those groups to help people understand what's out there and, and how it can benefit them. I'm hoping the National Campus Working Group can Help, help push for some of these changes and, and really continuing to advocate for these important parts of the cannabis industry. Absolutely. Okay, maybe uh, one last question um, before we move on to some of the, the Q&A. We've got some great uh, questions flowing into the Q&A. Um, so maybe looking looking forward a few years um, and uh, no one has a crystal ball, of course. And uh, you know, a few years as an attorney in the cannabis industry, but but you know, once once we have a, a fully legal uh, cannabis industry throughout North America, um, you know, which which may not be that far off. We have Mexico already moving towards that, um, and the U.S. You know, within the next year or two, how's that going to change the market dynamics within North America? Are we going to see cannabis move towards more of a traditional? agriculture kind of a play or or how, how it's how is that going to um kind of change how how um the, the markets uh, interact with each other i think like i mentioned when we were talking about the u.s cannabis i think you know the u.s is again going through those progressions and i think ultimately we're going to end up seeing that you know interstate so the entire you're gonna have national chains of cannabis companies um, in some way, shape, or form, I think you're going to see the same uh, flow within Canada, U.S., and Mexico, and really it's going to continue to expand globally. But it's going to take a very long time, right? And that's go not going to not something that's going to happen very quickly. It, there's a lot of politics that go behind those decisions, and a lot of other things that are factors that are going to be rolled into that. And so, I think that's not something you know that's really high. I think on anybody's priority list right now. I think right now is getting it right within each country, getting it understood and certain to get those regulations more figured out and ironed out. And then you're going to start to see that develop. And But I think that global, like a lot of things have moved to a more global economy. And I think that it's going to continue to develop that way with certain restrictions and things that will kind of, you know, speed bumps, if you will, that will get in the way. But it's still going to open up channels in a big way. And I think you're going to see that develop over time. 
I think one thing that you see now, um, and much to your discussion with with Nathan earlier around those um, service industries that support cannabis and the fact that those are now starting to grow, you're starting to see a lot more revenue come in from both, say, professional services as well as other types of services like um, Scott's Grow, I think, was the one that he had referred to. Um, I think that definitely helps it move more toward um, a mature industry similar to, say, more typical agriculture. But in my mind, one of the biggest hindrances and limitations right now is the fact that the downstream auxiliary industries that maybe would use a lot of the byproduct coming out of cannabis and hemp. So thinking about you know just sort of that chef that now we have to destroy with like cat litter, um, that, that, that all goes into waste, right? And so I think being able to actually say, will this actually be a commoditized product? We're probably a long way off of that, just given, you know, there isn't necessarily a whole paper industry that's set up to take in all of the, the byproduct of hemp or cannabis, cannabis to actually reduce their bottom line, produce revenue um, or increase profitability. So I feel like the industry cluster will stay pretty, say, focused on cannabis for the short term with that footprint growing and expanding over time. Um, but it's just something that, you know, I think it, it we're ways off before we start seeing, say, downstream manufacturers or specific, say, capital equipment companies building things for cannabis cultivation. Um, I, I could certainly see that being, you know, kind of the next tranche of, of sort of growth within the industry. Interesting. Okay, well, maybe we'll move on to the, the Q&A portion now. Um, so we've got a, a few questions uh, in the feed already. And I just remind the audience, if you uh, do want to pose a question to the panel, please put it into the Q&A section um, in the, on the stage tab uh, to, your, to your far top right um, on your screen. Um, so the first question I'll, uh, I'll put to you, we've got a couple of links on this one. Um, what challenges are posed with the growing movement to legitimize the First Nations uh, cannabis industry? Uh, thank you, Lauren Keatley, for that question. Does anyone have any thoughts on, on that one? We're seeing, uh, I guess, more, more and more retailers popping up on uh, First Nations uh, um, communities. And, um, and uh, how are we helping? Uh, or are those uh, being moved forward? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a difficult for me. It comes down to access at the at the same time um, when we're dealing with First Nations to kind of the general public. Uh, I think allowing us to provide access is absolutely critical, uh, kind of across the board. Um, so when we're seeing challenges, you know, I I, I think the the challenges that that we see. When you're trying to strike deals, it just feels like it's you know you're, you're just trying to strike a, a different deal or have a different form of communication. Um, and you seem to be falling down on the the access point, uh, which is why you get kind of the pop ups happening on on the reserves. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we can kind of start to eliminate that as well. But that seems to be a kind of an issue again across number of industries, not just not just cannabis. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a time play as well uh, from, from my perspective. And I, I think it's also um, some of the challenges are understanding what legislative uh, bodies or what legislation kind of dictates how you can, uh, how and what you can uh, provide to these First Nations. Um, because I, in a lot of cases, I think, I think um, these geographies have kind of their own bylaws and don't necessarily follow what um, Canada does or Health Canada uh, dictates. So navigating those legislative and regulatory landscape is part of the challenge here as well. I wonder um, maybe if the question was also just touching on say indigenous LPs or producers themselves. I think one lovely thing that I've seen across um, say the cannabis space when it comes to indigenous organizations is um, just the fact that you know they are, I think, being creative in terms of how it is that they're using the resources available to them, either it be land or different types of, um, say, tax or other regulatory programs that provide them with a slightly different or more nuanced regulatory structure in terms of how they can run businesses versus how, say, the more traditional sectors or private companies run businesses. And so, um, I certainly think it is, you know, a complex area to try to navigate. But at the same time, I do think that they. 
um, could definitely leapfrog a lot of the more, you know, say traditional LPs in, in Canada um, through creativity and through just, you know, I would say entrepreneurial spirit for sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Melissa. I think that opportunity is there. And, you know, ultimately the industry as a whole needs to continue to grow. And, and our biggest competition is really the uh, legacy market and, and taking away share there and getting ability to grow the cannabis industry as a whole. Right. And so I think that's ultimately the, the biggest thing that needs to happen to make sure the pie is big enough for everyone to share. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So this one's around innovation. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, how do you keep up with the pace of product innovation in new markets? Certainly, uh, as, we, as we talked about earlier, a very important topic for, for cannabis companies. So, so how do you stay cutting edge? I think you know you have to keep looking at you know it starts with the cannabis plant and you have to start looking at new strains and new new formats and that's breeding different plants together and consistently finding new product offerings from there and then growing into new formats that you can look into doing and you know the hardest thing to get over there I think we already touched on was really the regulatory restrictions we have right and so you know we try a lot of different products and you know there's so much restriction on what you can and can't do that as Melissa talked about with you know their product, there's a lot of products that are very difficult and get very close to making it to market and are maybe ready to be made to market, but we need the regulatory approvals to get there. Um, and those are very difficult to, hurdles to overcome, right? And so that's, I think, what I believe is the hardest thing to, to deal with within the Canadian cannabis space. Um, but there's still room for for finding new products and, and continuing to look for those new derivatives and get ready for it. And then it's just trying to continue to push the government to allow the regula regulations to release those products to the public. I do think that, um, you know, we're regulations are have been quite, I would say, cautious and measured, uh, which is a nice way of saying they've been a little bit slow. But I do think that when it comes to product innovation, there's just so if we at the same time as wanting to transfer a lot of the consumer buying from the black and gray markets into the legitimate market, a lot of the times for product safety, I think there's like a rainbow of products we haven't even touched yet that are already out there and available to consumers that, you know, we don't actually need to be that innovative for quite a long time, <laughs> as long as they're actually facilitating the regulation of it. Um, but, you know, like to Thomas's point, and like I mentioned earlier, like live resin, the shatters, the butters, like all of those things are like readily available. There's a huge demand for them, but it's like, how do you actually get that out to market in a, in a like meaningful and profitable way? Right. So um, I think the innovation is always, I, I don't know about um, the other folks on this call. I'm sure they would echo it too. But I think when you come across cannabis companies and you look at the products groups, they're some of the most passionate people you will ever work with. Mm -hmm. And that's only to the benefit of product innovation. But I do agree with Thomas that I think one of the biggest hindrances is regulation. Okay, right, let's move on to uh, another question here. This one is also um, along the lines of uh, innovation. So thank you, uh, Peter Graff, for this question. Um, does the panel see cultivation of highly differentiated cannabis driving sales? Does product innovation include genomic breeding and expansion of breeding programs as we see with traditional crops? So I, I think the short answer is yes. Um, but again, to Melissa's previous point, from an innovation standpoint, there's still a massive window here that we haven't actually even penetrated yet. I do, I do agree with kind of creating new strains, crossbreeding and developing new products is going to be coming. There's, we're still early days on actually driving through the products that are currently in the marketplace. But I think as we differentiate ourselves and grow and the market grows, 100% different strains, different formulations are going to be the key to survival. Um, you can only really turn over the same strains and make them into a brownie or a butter or a wax so many times before the market says I'm bored. Uh, so that's going to be at the core of kind of innovation, I think, going forward, uh, 100%. I agree. I think I touched on that with my last response regarding what we can do for some breeding options and stuff. Yeah. I think we're a long ways off before that type of differentiation will really play out in the market in a meaningful way with consumers. There's still a lot of education that needs to happen. 
Um, I can certainly see the genetics being beneficial to the actual cultivators themselves in terms of producing higher yields, shorter turn times, um, higher you know, terpene and THC contents and things like that. Um, but when it gets down into the market, I think we're quite a ways off before that is really completely understood by all consumers and patients. Okay, maybe a slightly different topic. Um, I think this one's looking for a comparison to the cannabis industry, but uh, the question, uh, thank you, Rhonda Walker, um, is uh, what are current marketing and advertising regulations for alcohol and cigarettes? Um, so I, I, I think perhaps the question is looking for like, how does it compare to what's being done in the, uh, with the regulations of the cannabis industry? I mean, I sort of joke that the hardest bits of alcohol and tobacco and uh, adult products, like all mixed in together, and that is the, <laughs> the cannabis regulation. But um, I'm not sure if other uh, the panelists had a, another thought on it. I say, you know, the closest that we relate to is closer to the tobacco with the warning labor labels and all of these cautionary things. But tobacco has more touch points where it's easier to access. You don't have to sign in to something. So cannabis is is really a step up from the most comparable thing with even more restrictions and and difficulties, I think, getting to the consumers. Um, alcohol, I think, although they have you know a lot of restrictions and things they need to play with, and as we talked about, like their bottles, their packaging, it can be very enticing, can be very alluring, and it can be uh, it can and it can be shown actively, right? And so, those are some of the big things I think as a cannabis industry that we we would like to see, obviously, um, but it's currently not allowed. Okay. Um, next question here is uh, going back to our conversation about legalization in the U.S. Um, so the question is, uh, do you think legalization in the U.S. will affect your pricing strategy? How can Canadian LPs best prepare themselves to compete against the anticipated new entrants? I, I think U.S. is probably one of my favorite topics. To be honest, I think it's one that we get talked on or touched on the most, and uh, it, it's probably, I believe, one of the closest to fruition. Um, and so, I think the U.S. legalizing doesn't really impact the Canadian marketplace as much. Um, as it impacts the Canadian players who can now participate in the U.S. market. The U.S. marketplace, I think you're not going to see as much of them coming over to us as much as you're going to see them being able to expand how they compete, as I talked about with the barrier starting to, to transpose. So I don't think you're going to see pricing changing really or impacting pricing in Canada. However, in the U.S., you know, if depending on the form that legalization happens, if there's going to be a reduction in the tax or a change in the tax laws and if they don't implement a equal or greater penalty in terms of an excise form then you're going to see cost savings from every producer that will then likely trickle its way down into the price and that's where you're going to see more of that price compression um, happening in the U.S. which isn't really going to be impacting margins and things like that as much at the bottom line but it will kind of change your top line growth that you're in your, your gross margins you're recognizing near the top. The other thing that I think that's going to impact that is if you start to grow into that national chain, then now you're going to get these national chains which are able to drive larger scale of efficiencies and be able to provide products again at a lower price. And that's where I think you're going to see more of that pricing take place. Uh, it's going to be more in the U.S. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. It's it's kind of interesting i we tend to look at the us in terms of the variety of products and the different things that are south of the border we haven't actually seen the same kind of price compression at the top scale in terms of the kind of the top end products that we've already seen in canada and, and we've seen it just because we're coastal we're national so uh, there's a lot more supply up here versus being in the independent states in the us uh, so it's interesting to see why we haven't seen the price compression the strategy you look for new products sales the border and then it doesn't really impact the pricing uh, compression standpoint but you do see we are seeing much faster price compression north of the border but it's it, it's not connected to the us per se 
Okay. The next question is on a, along a similar lines uh, line. Uh, this is from uh, Astrid Buchanan. Thank you. Um, what are you seeing as a typical price per gram of various products, and how do you see this changing over time? So perhaps speaking to the profitability of different types of products we've been speaking about. Uh, I'm going to refrain from commenting on anything within the current marketplace. Uh, I apologize. It's just simply due to the fact that we are releasing our financial results upcoming shortly, and I want to ensure I'm not providing any information that's not public yet. No problem. Brendan, do you know if they're referring to cost per gram, like around production, or like like sale price per gram? Um, it says price per gram, so I'm 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 assuming this question is more on the on the revenue side and the sales side, mm. and uh, perhaps uh, as it relates to uh, how that factors into the different products that are um, yeah. on offer. I think I mean just you know similar to Thomas treading cautiously, not commenting too directly on any one portfolio. I, I think you see that um, our price per gram is still higher than the black and gray market, which is a huge hindrance for sure. Um, sometimes it's pretty close, like where you're getting, you know, kind of a similar cost per gram at the individual gram level. But I think where we, again, are quite hindered by regulation is the ability to provide, say, um, volume discounts on larger purchases um, like you would see in, in the black or gray market when you're purchasing those types of like, you know, quarters or halves and things like that. So um, I, I certainly think that that's probably an area where there's still a lot of opportunity for growth. If you look at, say, OCS numbers, um, they do publish a lot of stats around cost per gram. I think there's still, in my mind, probably tiers to pricing where you have kind of middle market, which is a, where a lot of folks play. There's the value brands and the discount brands, which are much lower. And then there's a very small subset of the really high premium brands that I would say are still very niche market. Okay. Um, next one here is a pretty broad question, I guess. Um, so maybe um, if we could just touch on one or two points if, uh, if we have them. Um, so the question is, uh, what what will be the distinguishing factor for long-term players in the industry? What makes a success? Uh, what makes a successful and sustainable cannabis company? Uh, I can answer that very quickly. Profitability. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be the answer for any industry, any company, anywhere. You know, um, the key ultimately is going to come down to who can make, who can turn a profit, and who can um, do that. You know, there's multiple multiple ways of kind of getting to that, right? And so, um, but ultimately it's gonna come down to profits. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I would, it's hard to argue that one. Um, I think ultimately we should get out of talking about what's a good cannabis company to what's just a good company. And yes. it goes back to profitability and that's exactly how we're running the business. And many of the, guys, many of the people on the call are doing the exact same thing. Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting question where somebody watching us is asking what do we have to do to create a good company and there's lots of great companies out there profitability cash flow uh good corporate governance there's, there's a lot of different metrics that we should be judged by uh, and they shouldn't be any different for us because we're a cannabis company i think the one thing that i think is uh which makes it difficult for investors is really because of the opportunities that exist before us, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of growth. There's going to be a lot of changing in the in the regulatory environments and, and everything that's going to be happening. That people get very excited, but ultimately, you need to you need to be profitable and you need to continue to grow a profitable business um, and and really show that ability to to get to that profitability stage. Yeah, and just. To Melissa mentioned something earlier in terms of comparing the pricing to the legacy market. Uh, there also has to be an understanding that we may never get to legacy pricing just because of the infrastructure we have to sustain to be able to produce our products. So there's always going to be a gap there and everything has to triangulate to, even though there's opportunity, you know, we had this discussion in terms of international markets opening, there could be opportunities out there. It may not make prudent sense to go after them. Um, and having some of that, I think the, the cannabis space is being, uh, blessed with, uh, 
a lot of capital and access to capital in the early days, not necessarily, and, and that's been really kind of that first transition moving into the land grab. And now we're moving into the second phase, which is to uh, kind of profitability and building a business. Um, so I think that people have to start changing how they think about this sector um, because the, the old guard is, uh, it's different now. Well, you mentioned that, I mean, the, the legacy of market, uh, Dan, which kind of leads us into the next question we have here. And perhaps I'll paraphrase this one a little bit. Um, so the question is around, um, you know, those, those legacy uh, um, companies and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's asking if there's anything that the legal producers are trying to do um, uh, to, as I said, to do anything about um, those companies in terms of what's on offer out, out in the market. And, and I know that in, in discussions I've had with various people, um, there's a lot of uh, education still to be done, I guess, around what is legal and what isn't, especially when you're ordering online. It's very difficult to tell um, whether what's being provided is, is strictly legal within um, the, the Canadian regulations and, and what, what uh, perhaps isn't, and uh, obviously creates uh, uh, unlevel playing field when it comes to competition with those that are are um, are functioning within those regulations. So, is there anything that that um, is is being done to try to um, move those those participants out of the market, or is that just uh, something that just needs to be dealt with on a competitive basis? I don't think it's necessarily really purely a competitive basis because I think ultimately it's an education and it, it's really helping within the regulations to separate that because. You know, as Dan mentioned previously, you know, that price difference between regulated and unregulated is always going to be a thing because you're paying for regulation, right? And so that's additional cost that has to pass down to the consumers. But what it does is it provides consumers with a safe, reliable, trusted product that they can use that's also consistent, right? And so that's how as a as a competitive landscape, how we combat that is we continue to provide good, high quality product that is trusted and reliable and continue to build brands that are that resonate with consumers with with those in mind um, and ultimately then you you also need the government to to help and, and shut down and, and push back against some of these illegal um, markets and, and and fight that Great. Great. Thank you very much for that. So we're, we're just about at the end of our um, Q&A session, but there is one one more question we can squeeze in, I think, here. Um, this is from uh, Pedro Roberto. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is for newer entrants into the industry. Should the focus be directly on 2.0 products in order to be successful? <laughs> I think it's, you know, ultimately the same with any business, right? You don't focus necessarily, people are, are very much looking at, you know, this product's better than this product as it matters in terms of derivatives or formats and things like that. Ultimately the consumer decides, right? And so you're looking for creating a business that can be profitable, that can be sustained and that can be grown. Um, and if that means that you're gonna be carving a niche in the 2.0 products, and looking at that, you know, you look at things that you would look at in any other business. What's your consumer base? Is it growing? Is it what market is it competing with? Is it taking market share? Those are the things that you look at when you're evaluating these businesses. You don't, it's not as, it's not as simple as just to say, let's go for 2.0 products and we'll be successful or let's not. It's very much um, different pieces of a large, very large, what, what was it? I think it was $17.9 billion business which you can attack, right? And it can be directly in the cannabis um, production or cannabis products, or it can be in the ancillary businesses. It can be in all of the different um, things that will kind of continue on with it. I think you can have a successful business in any area of the cannabis industry. It's really about thinking, you know, what is your operating model going to look like and how can you play to your own strengths? So I, I think it's hard to say you should just focus on 2.0 or just focus on cultivation. I think it really, you need to look at your, your own circumstances and figure out where you're going to be able to make the biggest impact. So. Excellent. 
Okay, all right. well, that ends our Q&A session. So now what we're going to do is um, we have a, a networking uh, period available. Um, and the way this works on our Hopin platform here is, is a, if everyone looks to the far left of their screen, they'll see a little icon with networking um, below it. If you click on that and move into the networking area of the platform, the way it works is it uh, essentially sets up a kind of a speed dating, a, a two minute um, uh, interaction between yourself and another person that's in the networking session. So um, anyone interested in, in moving into that networking session, we'll, we'll do that in just a moment. Um, guys, uh, thank you very much for uh, for participating in the panel today. It's been really uh, insightful and interesting. I hope it, uh, the audience has enjoyed as much as I have. And I uh, look forward to, to uh, speaking with all of you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to take part in this panel and, and appreciate yeah, everyone. Yeah, Absolutely. great time with all of you, too. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.